Angel. And I'm Ricky Macias. And together we are... Un poquito. Un poquito podcast. Exploring Latin culture little by little. Hell yeah. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you're watching us on YouTube, go ahead and like, leave a comment. You know, comments make you sexy. I don't make the rules, dog. Uh, share us with your friends. Hey, share us with your friends. It helps us out. Uh, if you want to support us, uh, you can support us on Patreon. We have tiers 2 to $15. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You get access to bonus content. And actually, I'm going to interrupt the, ha- the housekeeping to announce that we have a live event happening uh, on March 19th yeah. at PDA Space in Altadena. That's public displays of Altadena. Uh, it's going to be a comedy show. Un Poquito presents Don't Fly Comedy, uh, hosted by Ricky Macias and myself. Ryan's going to be our headliner because everybody fucking loves Ryan. Jesus. <laughs> God. And uh, we're going to have past guests Mario Rodriguez, Gigi Garcia is coming back. We have uh, Joel Jimenez, uh, formerly of the Kill Tony band. He's a door guy at the comedy store. Very sweet man. Very, very funny. Um, it's going to be a really good night. Um the links will be all down below and i just want to throw it out there it will be live tickets will be ten dollars and it will be streamed tickets for that will be five dollars um, but if you are a supporter of the podcast to fifteen dollar tier you'll be on the list for free entry for either link or for in person so uh get us get at us about that and we're really excited about it i'm really excited about it it's gonna be a good time yeah Hell yeah. Um, we also have a Discord. We also have a Discord. You get up-to-date information on the Discord. We get into arguments all the time about this. All the Not time really. in the no, wrong no. channels. <laughs> <laughs> I swear. There's no arguments, but it's, it's, it's a lot of cool stuff. And actually, in talking about the Discord again, is we've been it's been popping up in like in our lives and and people on the Discord about finding like-minded individuals or finding people that uh, relate to the experience that they're living, but living in spaces where they don't have a lot of that solidarity. Uh, you know, if you live somewhere that's predominantly white or just predominantly non-Latino in general, uh, the, di- the Discord is a great place to start. Like, there's friendships being formed. Forged. Yeah, and you might even be able to find people near you. Yeah. Honestly. So join us in the Discord. It's free to join. We'll love to see you there. Um... You can follow us, social medias, at Un Pod. And uh, that's it for that. We're gonna, we're, we've been on an art kick the last uh, couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, we went to the Cheech Museum last week, um, had a great time. And I kind of have just wanted to follow that, like, keep the ball rolling. Somebody put it out there that we should talk about the art collective OSCO. Well, that's what we got on the menu today, boys. Mm-hmm. Did you guys have you guys known about Osco before we? Me personally, not at all. I started learning and hearing their names from you, and as we went to the museum. So this is all brand new to me. Yeah, I found out about it um, maybe a year ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think I started. So there's two. There's two kind of key groups. Um, they get talked about a lot. I mean, there's there's a whole slew of of Chicano artists that were popping up in the 70s and the 80s, but I think the two main names that you hear brought up a lot are Osco, which is ASCO, which is Spanish for Naza, Nazia, and um, another thing that we'll probably cover at some point in the future called Self Help Graphics that is still running, um, st- and you can go. It's a community based like. Uh, crafts, arts, I don't want to say crafts, but it's like an arts community space that they teach classes for different things. That's really cool. Um, and I think it's in South Central. But we'll talk about that another time. We, I keep seeing Osco get brought up. And um, to give a little bit of context to what it is, Osco was an art collective that we formed. was formed in 1972 right? yeah. by four artists, uh, Willie Heron, uh, Harry Gembo Jr., uh, Patsy Valdez and 
an artist that goes by the name Gronk. Gronk. Just simply Gronk. Which um, is like, sounds like a cartoon character. <laughs> well, <laughs> briefly, just speaking, of, I like that name because it has a very, like, descended from Azteca vibe. Like, it is. Like, all the names. I believe. Like, it, it reminds me of, like, um, it's just, like, a fun cultural aspect. Like, uh, all the names in Invader Zim of the, the Dib family. Uh huh. They're all based on uh, Aztec deities. Oh, wow. Yeah, that like family's Dib. Latino. Wow. Yeah. I mean, Joan and Vasquez. Yeah. So it's, it's Johan. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I believe he says in one of the interviews that he just goes by Gronk because I, fr- I I was listening to it while I was driving, so I didn't really catch it. But his name is short for something, mm-hmm. uh, and that's what he goes by. But Osco is like credited with kind of like starting this like conceptual art, performance art movement um, in East LA and. There's a lot of close ties to this organiz- to this collective. Uh, some of them were involved in the East LA blowouts, um, which, if you guys don't know, th- that was the the walkouts that happened yeah. in the 1960s, um, where the Chicano move. It was the event that kind of kicked off the Chicano movement of uh, re- education reform and justice for immigrants. Um, yeah, a lot of these artists were part of that. They came up in the mural scene. They were making murals for the movement, and then they moved away from that and started making like really interesting. Did you guys get a chance to see any of the art? Uh, oh, some of it, yeah. Uh, I was gonna say no. I mostly just focused on the interviews and like the research. But Gronk is also a painter. He had like two or three uh, pieces. In the the child the Teach Marin yeah Marin Museum yeah I wanted to bring that up so the, I feel like they're all painters like they've all done painting because I'm I know the I know that I saw Willie Aron's name I'm not too sure if I saw Harry Gambo Go, Go, Harry Gamboa's name pop up but I feel like I've seen all of their names for sure one thing that's really interesting is the paintings that we. Uh, enjoyed that we talked about of like the room the the ones that were very van gogh about like isolation and stuff that was patsy valdez oh really yeah Yeah. so those were her paintings um and we get to see some of them in in the interviews that we that we watched um in researching this group but i also know she did a lot of photography too yeah well the thing that's really interesting about the group is that they kind of did everything yeah like the way that they talk about it um is that they they all had the areas where they their focus was, which was a lot of uh, for some of them it was murals for Harry Gamboa, it was um, photography and they both her I think Patsy and Harry c- connected through doing um, photography. Mm. Patsy did a lot of makeup and she learned like theater makeup, costuming and stuff. And Gronk and Willie did murals, they did painting, and they also, like, put on plays. Um, But a lot of what it's, I don't know, it's hard to talk about a lot of this stuff, I feel like. Because a lot of what they did was very, like, intentional and very abstract and just was, like, made to kind of challenge what people's perception of art is yeah um one of the most famous stories i guess we'll start a little bit in the middle was was um you know they're all chicano artists they're coming out of the chicano movement and their thing was since the beginning was uh being noticed like hey we're here yeah like we are artists we're we're from this city and we deserve to be taken seriously. And they, they, they challenged a lot. Like there was a lot of messaging in a lot of their, um, a lot of their pieces. But one thing that they did, which you know, some people can argue whether or not this is actual art, but the performance of it, the act of it, I think, and and the statement that they were making was really powerful. Was the story is that uh, Willie Heron. <clears throat> The story is that Willie Aron 
was uh, on a date or like out with a friend at LACMA and they were going through all the exhibits and then at a certain point he notices like there's no Chicano art yeah on the walls so he's like what the hell like th this is LA this is LA this is the largest Mexican uh, city mar largest population of Mexicans outside of Mexico City and uh so he started like knocking on doors and like trying to find who the curator was and somehow found the curator and like just straight up asked him like, how come there's no Chicano art at LACMA? And the curator responded to him, well, Chicanos don't make art, they're in gangs. Yeah. So, so he took that and just like left and then came back with Gronk and Harry Gamboa Jr. And they signed their names at the bottom of the LACMA sign um, and pretty much said like, if you don't want to show our, our art, well, guess what? You're our, you're my art now. We're like, we're here. Yeah. You know, and they, they even like Patsy Valdez did, didn't go with them so that her, her name didn't uh, end up being uh, on the sign, but they went back and like took a photo of her by the sign. And then he, Willie really used that as like the art piece to be like, hey, this because the it only lasted like ten hours. They said yeah, like, they said they went back and it was already covered. Yeah, up. They, they went, went back, back the same day, day to take the photo with Patsy, and then they went back the next day and it was already yeah gone. Um, but the photo that they did take, uh, Willie just started sending it directly to people, directly to artists, directly to curators around the world, and like that's kind of. I feel like that's kind of where they started getting international attention, where they started like working together as like, not, um, <clears throat> that's where they started getting attention is like being taken seriously as like internationally as like these conceptual artists. Cause that's credited as the first conceptual art piece at LACMA was them putting their name on it yeah. and making that statement. No, yeah, I definitely like the the initial like conceptual ideas that they even just like choosing the name because you said it it means nausea. It's like a it's a word used to say like ew, gross, and so they were like claiming it. It's like oh this like this is gross art to everyone because it's because it's Chicano art because it's their art. So they they were like okay, you can call it what you like, but this is what I'm making. Yeah, so the name comes from a show that they all put together. This was before they were a collective. Like, I think they were all working together. So this is a common theme for this group, right? Of, like, being in people's faces and, like, yeah. kind of challenging perceptions and, like, challenging what um, what art means and, and how we see things. And, and uh, so, like, their very first show that they put together was called Osco, but the idea was that just, like, it's our worst pieces, stuff that nobody would show. And that's what they wanted to do was like everybody wants to put their best work, artwork out there and be seen a certain way. Well, we're going to do the opposite and like show our worst pieces. And yeah. somebody said like, oh, like the the curator or the whoever like ran this base was like, oh, this gives me Osco. Like, yeah makes me feel sick. This is gross. <laughs> and they were like, well, that's the name. Like, that's yeah. what we're calling it. And then they called the show Osco, and then the people just thought that that's what they were called. So then they were like, okay, we'll take it. Like, we'll, yeah. this is what we'll be called. I think like a year or two later, that's when they officially made it a collective. Yeah. Because they started in like 72 and like 73. They're like, now we're Osco Art Collective. Yeah. And even the way they approached like getting people to watch their art, it made me think of like comedy where like you go barking yeah, like outside of comedy clubs or near the comedy clubs and handing out tickets, like that's literally what they would do to show off their art is like kind of wrangle people, be like eccentric and like exciting to re reel people in, and then be she even I think Patsy even said to like like force our art on them, like <laughs> yeah, I I could see that. I mean, a lot of what they were doing, they were it's kind of like they were fighting a lot of fronts. Right? Yeah, they're in they're in an art scene trying to be taken seriously as artists. They're also trying to challenge uh, the mainstream perception of what a Chicano is. And they're also trying to show like Mexicans and Chicanos like, hey, we can be artists and we can be creative and like do things. And then they're also just like, you know, Patsy Valdez talks a lot about 
she's she's driven all of her every single piece of her art is driven from a feminist point of view yeah challenging you know the the patriarchy and challenge and a lot of their stuff challenges like societal norms so like one thing that came out was like uh after the east la riots um after the the blowouts and they had the riots i apparently east la used to have a christmas parade every year and they kind of took that away from them for like i mean yeah for safety reasons that's what they'll say but like they took away the parades yeah and then so one year they were the collective was like hey we're gonna do a parade we're gonna have a christmas parade which is funny because it's on paper it sounds like oh we're gonna do something nice for the community and put on a christmas parade but they show up in like the most like drab like macabre like uh patsy dresses as the Virgen de Guadalupe. Uh -huh. Sorry for my mispronunciation, but like <laughs> in very like it's just like a black and white costumes. They said that they didn't like uh, like con consult. What is it? They didn't consult each other on their costumes. Gronk, Gronk is like the most. I think he's like the two. I mean, of all of them, the two that I kind of got the most feel for was like Gronk was very much like this guy that's like he's the most like confrontational yeah yeah out of all of them of like I'm an artist like and I think that Gronk is he was gay right like I think he's the one that had to like fight like literally fight for himself to defend himself and I feel like in his art was really part of that yeah because he was showing up like he talks about in the seventies, you know, in East LA where there's, there are, you know, a lot of like cholos and there's, you know, tough guys and just like, or just very conservative, yeah. uh, neighborhoods. Like he, he would walk around wearing super flamboyant, like yeah. he would walk around yeah. wearing makeup. He had platform shoes, tight pants, polyester suits, like very just like in your face, like recognize me. Yeah. Like, Again, that's where I think this theme starts. Is like he's like, you will like notice me. I, I yeah, I don't care who you are. I'm going to be whatever I am. Yeah, and he did this thing. I forget. I don't know if it's Gronk or if it's one of the other guys. I feel like it was Gronk. Um, but there's a story where he goes to like a, a gallery and tries to show some of his paintings uh, to to be shown in in the gallery, and they reject him. They're like, no, you don't like, we're not, we're not taking this. So as protest, he gets all of his artwork and brings it to the front of the gallery and then just lights it on fire in protest. Yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's a lot of the stuff that they did. I think looking at it now through the, through the mm -hmm. lens of like modern day. And if somebody was to try to do this type of thing today, I'd be like, that guy's kind of like crazy. Like, I mean, thinking about the stuff that they did, like a couple of people, a handful of people walking through East LA dressed up as a Christmas tree. And yeah, was yeah. Like, like, you probably wouldn't hear about it. You might see video videos of it on yeah, social sure. media. But in the 70s and 80s, like, the stuff that they were doing was, I mean, getting attention. Yeah. And, uh, and I think, I don't know if I'm the kind of person that at the time would have gotten it. And I do think I benefit from the fact that from what we've seen, they explained what their intentions yeah, were, yeah. you know, with these art pieces. And I'm like having the explanation. I'm like, Oh, that's fucking cool. I like that. And I think, I think it, seeing that conversation, having them explain their point of view makes me rethink a lot of like what people do with art and entertainment in general. Like it, it makes me rethink like, when people do things like that, it's like, oh, it feels like a manipulation sometimes. Yeah. And it and it makes me turn away from things that maybe I would like anyway and they and they might know I would people like people would like it, mm -hmm. but the only way to get eyes on it is to be wild or ridiculous or in your face. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's that was kind of the name of the game, especially back then when there wasn't a lot of social media. Do you have something to say? I was just gonna ask what you meant by manipulation. Um, like, like they're like, cause they were performance artists. Yeah. Yes. Yes. In a way art is manipulation, right? Because you're, you're, you're evoking certain feelings out of someone and people in just take consume art to feel something there's an agreement there. Right. Um, because 
I don't mean manipulation as like inherently a bad I was like, thing. Isn't that when you're gain? Isn't manipulation come with gaining? It's it's about uh, changing something. Okay. All right. Okay. I understand it's literally what you mean just by that. The, the little. I guess I was thinking of it like like somebody being manipulative. Um, in a way, it can be like that's the most extreme negative version. Right. Of right. That. Okay. Okay. I understand um, that. Then. Well, I think part of that is that they were unapologetic of who they were. So yes. they weren't afraid of like sometimes like doing dangerous things yeah. or like, um, got to crack a few eggs to make an omelet. <laughs> yeah. I, I, but I do see that of like, they were disruptive. Yeah. You know, they were marching through the city. Like one of the pieces that they did was, uh, Willie dressed up as Jesus Christ and they made this gigantic cross and like he marched through East LA because he was, but he was protesting the Vietnam War and he was protesting uh, the recruitment of Chicanos to fight this war that he didn't agree with. Yeah. Um, and one of the big reasons is worth noting that it wasn't just against recruitment. It was, it was this. You got to remember that all of this comes from the the birth of the Chicano movement, right? So, like, at that time, they, they said that their recruitment officers would set up shop down the aisle from people getting their diplomas like, yeah. at, at, at Chicano high schools. And a statistic they said was that Latinos made up about 6% of the population, uh -huh. but they made up about, like, if I'm, I might remember this part wrong, but 22% of soldiers that either went or died in Vietnam were Latino. Yeah, so the, essentially they were used as cannon fodder. Yeah. I was like, well, warriors, well. That's like, <laughs> Yeah. But, so, but, okay, so, you, so Josh brought up, like, the idea of, like, Chicanos being warriors. Um, I, I have a lot of Latino family who's served, and they're down as fuck to die for this fucking country, dog. There's a lot, there's a conversation to be said about, yeah. about nationalism and about like well, chicano but, patriotism and pride in general and pride because i remember i got so upset because you know we i at the time i was living in baldwin park and i was driving from la into baldwin park on the 10 east and there's a big ass uh billboard that is uh right behind the 605 so you see it as you're entering entering baldwin park and this I think it was, it must have been like 2014 to 2016. I don't know. But the Marines put up a billboard in Baldwin Park that had a, a it just had a Mexican Marine on it. And he was in he was in the fancy uniform that they have when they do parades and shit. Um, sorry ceremonial if I don't know. The garb? Ceremonial garb. Sorry. That's what's up, Ryan. Respect of former Marines. But uh, it's it said celebrating Mexican or celebrating Latino values since 1945 or something like, I don't know, whenever the year, but celebrating, uh, uh, Latino values. Yeah. And I was like, this is the most manipulative yeah. advertising I've ever seen. And I feel like it is a, a, a valid point to, to make for clarification that when we comment about our, our, uh, what would you call it? Dissuasion? No, that's not a word. Disillusionment? No. It, it, it's criticism isn't to people... It isn't to the individuals who have a desire to do this as, as a vocation. It isn't to the people who believe that this is uh, both necessary and like a you know passion and responsibility on their own right. We're talking about the people that are willing to manipulate that idea. I mean, here's the thing. I'm going to speak for myself and nobody else in this room. I'm very much anti-military. I do not think... Obviously, it's an it's a ideal utopian dream, you know, to say we, don't, we shouldn't have a military. We shouldn't have nuclear weapons. We shouldn't have a defense. Look, you can tell me that I'm naive and all that stuff you want but i still believe that you know and so i will say i'm 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 not pro military and and that's outside of the fact that uh 
you can have a predatory recruitment system uh, for people of color. Absolutely. You know, and a big well, part of this, a big part of all of this is that, again, reinforcing that they're not pushing f- at the time, not pushing for Chicanos to go to school to get high paying careers. They're not accepting their art. They're not like they're not taking them seriously. They're teaching them. Uh, how to be cooks and cleaners. They won't, that's literally what, yeah, they only want them to do like vocational training for like be a mechanic, be a cleaner, be, only do the blue collar jobs. Right, and yeah. a lot, and sorry, I'll finish this thought and then I'll let you talk. Um, but the, the protesting against that is, is in, in a lot of ways saying, hey, we're not good enough to be anything else, but you want us to go die for you? You know? Yeah. Predatory recruitment. Hey everybody, we want to take a second to thank our sponsor, Legacy Teas and Spices, which is a company run by our mom, Angel Mesco, who's here with us today. Hey guys. Normally me and Ryan give you the spiel, but uh, today we're going to let my mom tell you about her teas, uh, so why don't you take it away? Yeah, I just wanted to mention we have uh, several medicinal teas in stock. A lot of people have been asking. A lot of people have New Year's resolutions that they're working on. So we have tea to help. And so I just wanted to mention we have an immune system to help boost your immune system. We have a stress-free tea. We have a good night tea that helps with sleep. We have turmeric ginger that helps with inflammation. We have a detox that's a cleansing tea. We have a digestive aid. We also have a weight management tea. We're, we're all trying to get healthy right now and with a proper diet and some exercise, these teas can really help you out. We have different sizes and today we're holding up, uh, this is like a starter size. It's a $12.95, but with your code, you get the discount. And this can give you about 12 servings, uh, give or take, depending on how much you use. But this is all artisan, hand blended by myself. Um, and yeah, we have many flavors. Check out our website. Uh, using UP23, at checkout so that we know you came from uh, watching Un Poquito podcast. It gets them 23% off their entire purchase online at LegacyTeasAndSpices.com. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for having me. Thanks, you guys. But what I'm trying to clarify for people that hear that and they're immediately defensive is that we aren't against the people who do have the... Like he's saying, like, you're asking us to want to die for these countries. Like, nobody's saying it's a bad thing to want to die for the country. We're saying that there's people taking advantage of that desire. They're manipulating you because they know they can. Yeah. Before we get too deep into this, it's a pro, pro, pro anti-military conversation. Uh, I only want to speak on, you know, what this group is doing at the time. Yeah. And what they're, what they're talking about. We can have a conversation about the military uh, at a later time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is what they were doing. Like, this is these are the things that they were fighting against. And yeah. like, even the, again, a lot of what they did that I think is very interesting, which at the time, I might have been the kind of person to say, these are annoying people, you mm-hmm. know, because they even got pushback from the Chicano movement because they were trying to... Uh, murals were a huge part of the Chicano movement. They were uh, used to spread ideas, concepts to the community. They were used to promote um, unionization and workers' rights. They were used to promote like uh, education reform for Chicanos, immigration rights, etc. And so, a lot of these peoples from from the movement were criticizing Osco for making art that wasn't Chicano enough. Yeah. Um, and so they would even challenge that that idea, which for me, I think is very important because like there's this whole idea of like, what does it mean to be Latino? What does it mean to be Chicano, Mexican, Mexican-American? We, we had a discussion about it on Discord. Somebody brought up like, what does a light, white Latino mean? Like, mm-hmm. And I think a lot of... A lot of people get mixed up in this idea that you have to be a certain way to be 
Chicano that, or be to Latino, be valid to be valid, right? And I think what they were doing, what Oscar was doing, was saying like, "Hey, we are Chicano and we're this, and n- those things don't cancel the other ones out." Because even Patsy had to deal. She talked about having to deal with that, but also being feminist enough. They're like, "You're a feminist. Why are you hanging around with these other guys?" And yeah. she's like, and like she even got blowback from like doing a picture where they tied her up or like wrapped her up. Like, oh, the duct tape. The I duct forgot tape. What the the art piece was called. I forget exactly what it's called, but she she was getting it from like all angles of like, oh, you're not Chicana enough. You're kind of like a hippie Chicana, and, right? And it's like that's not Chicana, yeah. and they're like so, and you're not even feminist enough, and it's like she's like yeah, but these are people that helped me do what I wanted to do. And it's like, I got to be who I wanted to be in this environment, in this space. And even in that picture that she got blowback from, she's like, what you don't understand is that picture. That's how I felt Mm -hmm. that everything was like trying to restrain me and control me. And that I got out of that. Yeah. So that piece also, I need to clarify uh, the thing that I talked about, LACMA, I used the wrong name. It wasn't Willie. It was Harry Gamboa Jr. Okay, okay. He was the one that went and did that. Um, I think it's called Instant Mural. Instant Mural, yeah. That 1974. was the piece. So what they did, it was, she was a performer in the piece. I believe it was Gronk's, like they, they collabed on it, but like Gronk's, Gronk's idea of like the Instant Mural. Um and what they did was they they did Patsy up in makeup and print, just duct taped her to a wall mm-hmm. and uh, she remained still. And it's interesting the way that she talks about it because th- she was being duct, duct taped to the wall and like people are coming up and like, hey, are you OK? Are you safe? Like, do you need anything? Do you need help? And she would just remain still. She would respond to them. And then after uh, after some time she got off the the wall some of the tape remains and then that becomes another art piece you know in of itself but the concept of that that she talks about is like how at a certain point things become a choice i th- i think this there's this idea of uh from osco uh of of again they're very confrontational and they like to challenge these concepts and i think a lot of it is just this idea of like making a choice to stand up for yourself, being yeah. vocal, um, and to not accept the way that things are. And it's and it's interesting because like I think our community still fights and deals with even that that choice to be confrontational or not be confrontational, and it's still like a dividing line on how we should approach things. I feel. Like some of us still have this mentality and that something that I feel like they were fighting, like you're saying, is we can't keep putting our heads down and trying to be a good worker mm-hmm. because that doesn't actually help us. Like her not being Chicana enough, her not being uh, uh, enough of a feminist, like she has to be confrontational. She has to fight all this stuff because otherwise she's just restrained. And this was her way of like, fighting all that yeah it's it's the idea you know not i don't want to speak for her but it's this idea of like she's a feminist wherever she goes because that's yeah you know those are the things she believes in those are the things that she stands up for and that's what's reflected in her art um and i mean it's interesting because i do think during that time for women and for feminism uh, sorry, I was going to misspeak for <laughs> women and for feminism uh, that like it's part of it. There's this idea of like, I'm not like the other girls, uh, which, you know, I don't know if it's my place to speak on, but I do think part of that comes to I don't she never outright said like, oh, I'm not going to hang out with you. She never was tearing down uh, in any of the interviews that I've seen. Like, yeah, she's not tearing women down to put herself up. It was just like this is the people that she feels comfortable with and there she's making the art that reflects her beliefs yeah. and still being criticized for it. Yeah. She had a choice and she wanted to use that opportunity. Yeah. Did you guys see the piece that was called, uh, the last gang member killed in East LA? 
No. Not I don't think so. during the research, but I know that I've seen it before. Because a lot of, like I, like we had mentioned at the top, a lot of this stuff had been referenced or, like, retained by um, Cheech Marin and his collection. Uh-huh. And I'm pretty sure that I saw at least a photo of that um, when he was at LACMA. Okay. So he it's it's did. been a minute. I would have been, like, tw- I think maybe 14 at this time. Yeah, it is, a, it is a photo, and it's honestly one of It's probably my favorite thing that Harry Gamboa did, which was he was talking about at the time, which was probably the late 70s, early 80s. I don't know the exact time of the piece, but what they noticed was there was a lot of gang violence happening in East L.A., and what they saw was whenever there would be a victim... Um, the media, the news outlets that were reporting on on a death would give the names and, like, they would give all the information about the victim's families or about, like, the, 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 the perpetrator's families and then, and give, like, where they worked, what their names were, like, what areas that they lived in, um, and (laughs) essentially giving... Uh, gang members like more information so that they could go and kill those people and like so it just kept like feeding this cycle of like violence and so what Harry Gumbo decided to do was he got uh, Gronk to go lie in the middle of the street and he took a photo of it and he called it the last gang member killed in East LA and he mailed that to all of the uh uh news outlets like yeah. independent local outlets and mailed it to all of them and like convinced them that that was the last gang member killed in East LA didn't give any other information and they stopped that's the one it's actually it's actually called a decoy gang war victim oh is that what they called it that's what it's been said on the on everywhere I've seen oh I don't know because the, the so. from the Trifact interview Street. from the interview that that uh, I saw yeah. of Harry Gumboa Jr. talking about the piece. That's what he called That's it. That's cool. As uh, the last gang member killed in East LA, but essentially he uh, he sent it to all of these news outlets, and then they 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 stopped reporting on gang gang violence, and supposedly like actual real world gang violence, like took a dive for a month like wow so i don't know there's like just like real a a lot of what they did too was just like challenging what the ideas of like chicanos are like not just for themselves or for their community but for for the community at large like for you know white people or just for a society outside of east la um i believe uh I believe Willie Her- Willie Aron was the one was one of the people behind a, a mural called "The Wall That Cracked Open," and it was a big deal because a what a a lot of people what a lot of businesses were doing at the time was they were um, commissioning murals to be painted on their walls because they were trying to cover up. Graffiti, because graffiti had been a thing since, like, the 40s in Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, a lot of people saw this as, like, eyesores. And, and so they would commission these big murals to cover them up. And so Willie gets commissioned to do a mural on this thing. And instead, what he did was he painted around the the graffiti and incorporated the graffiti into his piece and kind of paying respects to the artists that put that stuff up and to the community that, that revolved around that in the first place. And I think that was, it's interesting because he's showing people like, Hey, I'm not above you. Like we're, we're both artists. We're both like deserve respect. And I, and not only to each other, but to, to, the society at large, like I said, like he's trying to say like, no, this is, this is worthy. This is technique. This is something that, 
that deserves attention and, and respect. Deserve to even take up space. Yeah. It would have it been funny if he just got like a giant picture frame and just posted it on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been cool. Yeah. What do you think you or other Latinos or other Latino artists could learn from them? Or what have you learned from them or can use? Well, personally, and this goes back to like a conversation we've had before. We even had it like on the last episode um, of like uh, movements like this are just proof that like the need for this identity exists. It's not even like. Well, because there's this huge ambiguity in the Latino community of, like, you know, it's constantly what side to pick, uh, you know, whether or not to acclimate or establish yourself, you know, whether or not you want to deal with that ridicule, and, and whether or not you belong in any other community when you're Latino, because people just assume that, that all we do is, 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 like, work and exist in the background. And this is a, a, the kind of movement that, like, proves that we are into other things it's you know it's not just what you see in like movies as the latin neighborhood or you know or like um even in movies like friday where like the latinos are reduced to a very stereotypical aspect of it um you know there's there's latinos into punk there's latinos into all you know styles of art there's latinos into to goth and emo right and uh I think that remembering them is is, is is important because it reminds people that like there's always uh, no community is a monolith. There's always going to be people that are feel different or like want to be different and just be like comfortable who they are rather than what people expect them to be. Yeah, I don't know if this is like a good insensitive comparison, but it's like it's like Latinos are masking into like white specifically white american well, code switching code switching but it's like it feels like a masking in the sense of like code switching doesn't feel like our term specifically but it feels like a masking because we do it so much that it doesn't even feel like code switching sometimes it just feels like almost by default in daily life you kind of just have a worker personality for more than just work sometimes right and it's like getting out of that and allowing yourself to get out of that and that it's okay is is a way of taking up more space by being more authentic even if it's like jarring to people yeah i so to answer the question i kind of did a little bit of extended research on this and i just started reading about more of the artists that we uh, saw at the Cheech, Mer Cheech Museum and uh, was watching interviews from them. And two things happened for me in researching Osco and researching uh, uh, this piece because uh, our, our researching Cheech, uh, the art show that he sponsored years ago and then uh, now he has a museum, is so... One thing about Osco is that they did that piece where they signed the name with their names on it uh, in 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 the seventies, and even then they still weren't shown at LACMA until like twenty two thousand eight. I want to say like they or no, they had their actual show in the they had an actual show that wasn't part of of Cheech, I want to say in like 2011, maybe 2011 to 2014. Um, but that was a specific Osco show. Um, and one of the, I forgot which artist talked about it, but he said like, yeah, we got that show, which we're grateful for. We should have their show, but there's still no collections. Like LACMA still doesn't collect Chicano art. And I feel like even today, if we went to the museum, like they don't have, like Chicano art. Um, and I think in seeing the interviews of, of all of the artists that are part of Cheech's museum, um, two things happened for me. One is like, this is kind of the whole reason we started this podcast is like the Mexican art, Mexican American Chicano is like, 
you're valid if you want to make this type of art like you sh you shouldn't feel like you're just chicano art you know or you're yeah. just mexican or you're just latino art like whatever you do whether well if you want to do stuff that touches on you know your community and your identity and that stuff is just as valid and it des deserves as much respect as you know a van gogh painting uh just to throw a name out there but like there's there are there is art there are our works that are being done that focus on on chicano identity latino identity that is brilliant that is kind of being overlooked because it has that tag on it right yeah and that artwork is super valid and anything that anybody wants to do they want to explore their identity and they want to talk about their community and they want to relate to that side of themselves uh they should do it and it's and it's just as valid as anything else out there right the other thing that happened was like I'm watching these interviews of Osco and like watching the artwork that they made and like the movies like we didn't even get into like they made like short films and they 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 had this thing called no movies where they would take uh static images like f photos of like very elaborate scenes that felt like they should be in a movie anyway they have a movie that i think you could watch called baby cakes um and then i think uh, something called blue servant there's stuff that you can see of their work and to me i'm like this is happening during the 70s right mm -hmm. i'm thinking about this movie i saw a documentary which i think is on apple music apple movies uh about the velvet underground of uh, the band and I don't, are you guys familiar with the velvet underground yeah i'm aware like lou reed and andy warhol and that whole scene so like for people that don't know uh they came up in the 70s right yeah i, I think so they, they they were around in the 70s <laughs> when, when was andy warhol thing in the 70s right uh i think it was the 60s hold on i could be wrong but my whole point is like austin powers that's how i reference it i'm pretty sure it's the 70s the Velvet Underground formed in 1964. Oh, shit. Mm. Wow, they were really, really... But my whole point is, like, they are... There's this thing... There was a scene in the Velvet Underground documentary where they're talking about the New York Underground scene. They're talking about Andy Warhol and his workshop and... Um, and... Uh, a lot of these artists that were in this group and I'm not discounting the art that they made or saying that the art that they made wasn't good, but the egos on these people in this movie that I saw <laughs> was just like barf. Like there's one guy, I forgot what he was talking about, but they're showing like, they're showing like stock, like old footage of like these artists hanging out and one the guy that's talking is like, yeah, there was this guy, and he was the first. He's the only person doing like Chinese chants. He didn't. It wasn't Chinese chants. I don't want to misquote him, but it was along those lines of saying like, this this is the only guy doing this Chinese thing. Yeah. And this is the only guy doing this, and we were the first people to do this. And you know, it was if it was happening in the '60s, they probably were a lot of the first people that were doing this and challenging the mainstream. But the thing that stood out to me is that the predominantly like those people in that scene were white and this isn't a hate on white people rant this is i think because of that there's this idea there's a lot of people that don't see non-white people doing stuff that these people are doing they're not associated with this art and then you look at some of the stuff that's coming out of osco in the 70s and to me i'm like this is a lot of stuff that I could see happening at like a warehouse today. Yeah. Like a lot of weirdo uh, noise bands, like obscure stuff that I might be into that I think is really cool. So kind of, I feel like you guys touched on it and I just want to reinforce that idea of like seeing this stuff being made by Chicanos and like them saying like, Hey, this is Chicano art. Like this is a reflection their identities as Chicanos went into the art that they made, even if the art that they made wasn't quote unquote Chicano yeah, enough. Yeah. And so I just see that. And I think like, 
it, it reminds me of like the times where I talk about how I put up personal boundaries between myself and identifying with culture because I was like, oh, I'm not that kind of Mexican. Like I just happen to be Mexican or whatever. And like, I won't listen to this kind of music and I won't watch these kinds of movies. And also the stuff that I like, like it's not Mexican. Like they people, no, nobody's doing this, but you, there's proof. You just got to look for it a little bit. There's yeah, proof. Yeah. Like these people are making that. Like the yeah. fact that you're Chicano, that you're Latino and that you like something, there's other Latinos that like that just, and that are doing that. Yeah, sometimes you we start to share things that we liked out loud, and we're like, oh, yeah, we all like it. Like, <laughs> yeah. like there's like a band we all happen to like, and we're like, oh, I just thought this wasn't Latino. Like, literally, in the back of my head, like, this is not Latino, or yeah. not Chicano, whatever. Like, it's not. And then I share it with you guys or other other Latinos, and they're like, oh, I loved it. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's like, sometimes it's just a vibe, and sometimes... It's something we just didn't share out loud enough. Mm -hmm. But even just like seeing how many Latinos love anime before (laughs) it became really cool. That was like, if you remember seeing like an immigrant dad take his son to a manga store, like you don't, you don't, (laughs) you don't know. Like this is real. This is always. Mexicans love Dragon Ball Z. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, love Dragon Ball Z. Huge. It's been talked about a lot recently, but it's like not to start a fucking race war to like say anything (laughs) out of pocket. No, it's because like it's a trope. It's a trope that like black people love anime, right? Uh-huh, like uh-huh. that's that's a meme, like, um, and that's been going on for like years, and only recently that it's become a thing where people are like, Mexicans like anime? What the fuck? Yeah, and it's like good. actually Mexicans had anime before. That's why when people started talking about liking anime or like thinking it's weird, I'm like, literally we used to watch that growing up. Like yeah. I don't know how I I always thought it was being something that was always around. Yeah, because like. People started realizing black people loved anime when black Twitter started becoming a thing people were aware of. Right. And then they saw the memes. They're like, they love anime. And I'm like, e- yeah. Like, who? Everyone, <laughs> everyone loves anime. And the more stuff, like Latino stuff that comes out and is revealed about us. Yeah. As just a matter of fact, people are like sometimes surprised. It was funny when you were describing that. I just wanted to answer that um, that documentary about those white artists and creators. The first thing I thought was like, "This is that generation's like spa water moment." <laughs> like, oh yeah, we're we're the first ones to think of it. Yeah. <laughs> no one's ever done this before. The, th- the thing is, is like, I don't I don't want to misquote them. I remember him saying like, "It was a lot of we were the first people to do this. We're the only people doing this," and like. One of the things was like, oh, we were the first person, the first, the first people to like work with tones, like as like they were, they would do like soundscapes essentially, and so they would like try to stretch a tone out. You have to watch it. I can't explain it. I'm not a music person, um, but there was talking about dealing with like resonance and tones, and I was like, what you're describing is like Tibetan throat singing or like Gregorian chant, like not Gregorian chants, but like, like, chant like. People are doing this. Like, you're not the first person to discover this, right? That was my whole point of, like, seeing that movie. And, it, I mean, if you like The Velvet Underground, it's fine. It's a fine movie. It's not that good, but it's okay. I like the band. The band's, you know, good. Um, also, I kind of want to throw out there that um, I know not everybody listens to the radio, but because of my job, I drive, and uh, I'm only allowed to listen to the radio. Uh, like I can't put blue. T- anyway, there's a radio station. I don't know the name of it because I never get the chance to hear what the name of it is, but it's 90.7. Um, and at night they play a lot of like Latin music. Some of it is very traditional. There's a lot of cumbia. There's a, uh, a lot of, it's 90.7. Like, where are you driving? Oh, it's, it's, uh, Los Angeles to... Um, San Gabriel Valley. Ooh. KPFK. KPFK, I think. Pacifica but radio. at night they it's a it's an independent radio station. It's listener sponsored. Yeah, listener sponsored. Um, but at night they play a lot of like Latin music. But what's really cool is that they also play a lot of like music by Latinos, music that's in Spanish, that is like, runs the gamut of... Really? Uh, of genre. Like, 
uh, literally last night before recording this, I was listening to the to the station, and they were going from like rock and espanol to like EDM to like kind of like dark indie like um, stuff that was like very similar to like Future Islands that was like, but it was just like in Spanish, and like. It just is. It's it's a whole slew of, of genres that's just like all made by Latinos and is Spanish language. So it's like I kind of wanted to throw that out there to be like, hey, there's there's people making this stuff that that you might enjoy, that you can relate to more. Um, not to say you shouldn't like stuff that's made by white people, even though I get the reputation for hating whites. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, uh, but there are, I mean, I, I just think, you know, you don't have to feel like there's nobody making art like you for you. Um, and that you don't have to feel guilty. Because I've felt that way before on my own thing of just being like, I guess I talk a lot about putting up barriers on myself of like, this music isn't made for me. The stuff that I like isn't made by people like me. And then if you do a little bit of research, because all of these musicians perform in Latin America, like yeah. there's going to be people making music like this. There's going to be just the fact that, that you are who you are and that you like something. That means that there's somebody out there like you that enjoys it as well. And that is making it. And so I feel like this is when you tell us that you're a big fan of Drake Bell. No. <laughs> um, For those that don't know, he has like an enormous following in Mexico. He almost, he does like almost exclusively music in Spanish right now. Uh, really? I yeah. also heard that. I've heard some bad stuff. Yeah, I heard that he's hiding out in Mexico. Like that's why he moved there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, that too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he uh, extricated himself. Is that the term? No, he was like on trial for some misconduct with a fan, but uh, he won the case. He Wong. doesn't live. He tours there a lot, but he doesn't like live there. He has a tequila um, he in company America. out there. Well, anyway, that to answer your question, long winded, but that's what I learned is just like it exists or it, it can exist. It exists or it can exist, like and what, you can make it. You can make it, and I, you know, I'm, I harp on this. Not I mean harp, but I brought it up multiple times. Like you can do it. Like we, we're touching back on the attainability and possibility of like what we've talked about on the patreons or maybe even some of the mains of like this is all possible yeah it takes time but if you have any interest in it you're probably going to like it even when it's hard to reach your vision or goal or whatever it is um but you know like one of my favorite bands growing up was the mars volta mm -hmm. and it's like they're like chicanos like they're from texas they're from el paso i think yeah. and it's like yeah, they're from Pals. That's where right. Why are you looking at that? You look I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, it, you know, I didn't find them. My brother found them, and he introduced them to me. And there was other bands that were, like, kind of Chicano bands, just cause, like Deftones. And there's there's other bands that, like, just as far as music, like, why did I connect with it so heavily? Like, there's nothing. There wasn't, like, the Mars Walton at the drive-in inherently didn't have anything specifically Latino about it at first. Some of the band songs are in Spanish, right. but like I connected with it. Yeah, I think I think there's things where I think on the surface you might not be able to see. Yeah, and then once you find out, you're like, oh, like not even just like, oh, that's why I like this so much, but it's like you start to hear things that you're like, oh, that's where this comes. There's like this like yeah. influence of music that I've heard before. Yeah, you know. Like, uh, there's this band that's called, um, Dios Malos. Oh, really? And it's so funny because first they were called Dios and then they became Dios Malos, but the Malos is in parentheses, right? And I, I remember, I've been listening to this band since like 2002, maybe since I was in like sixth grade and they're not a famous band like by any means they had a brief pop uh one of their songs was featured on uh the oc um and they kind of got discovered by a band that's big in the indie scene called granddaddy i don't know if i'm like saying a dumb thing where you guys know who i'm talking about 
No. Uh, but there's a band called Granddaddy that was very popular in like the indie scene. And uh, anyway, uh, I always thought that Dios Malos, there's a song called Starting Five that is one of my favorite songs. Like it's a really good song. Um, it's very like twee kind of poppy, but it's a lot, it's, it's really good. I always thought as a kid, when I heard about that, that I always had an issue with them being called Dios Malos, Dios Malo, because I thought, I thought it was like a quirky thing that like some white guys did to name their band. Ah. Like. Dios Malo with the parentheses. Like, I don't know. This was an assumption. I'm coming clean, okay? This is an assumption that I made. And then one day I kind of just, I just went, I just lived with that assumption until like a year ago. And then I went and did a little bit of research and I was like, these fools are from Hawthorne, like from down the street. Like, that's crazy. And they were actually a psychedelic band, <laughs> which is on is like right on the money for being like a Latino band in the LA area. Yeah, yeah. They're actually a psych band and they actually like reformed and started playing shows more recently. And it just happened that this one album they, they put out, they went for a sound change and was like a little bit more like easy listening, like oh, indie. We should, we should check it out. But I was like, oh shit, they're all Latinos and they're fucking like the singer's dark. Like, uh, <laughs> like it was a cool thing. So it's like, Having knowing that, and so you like them more because of that. Yes, because hundred percent, Josh. It just is like it's a thing in in terms of like validating validating my identity, right? I would have I liked the music already. I had fully accepted they were white. Okay, so get off my back about that. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that I was like, oh shit, these are actually like brown foods is like. It reinforces that idea. Like I said, like, hey, there's people that are like you making stuff that you like that have experiences that you can relate to and similar tastes. And that is very affirming, right? Um, that you don't have to feel like you... Because cause, um, even learning about this Osco thing, like, I used, to, I, I used to go to a lot of indie shows. Like, I was part of, like the DIY scene, like I wasn't a musician, but I would go to a lot of DIY shows at Paris space at the smell. Um, yeah, I've been to the smell too. Yeah. And <laughs> said it's so dramatic. Oh, I've been to the smell. These, these places are like, you know, the smell, not so much Paris space a little bit more. Um, and it's something that I it didn't really click for a while until you start like talking to people and you're like, Oh, you are different is like, it's, it's, these are predominantly white spaces. Right. And it was, it was, it, <laughs> it was kind of like, it wasn't an issue until it started to be an issue of like, these people would just like say some weird microaggression shit and like you started to feel like oh like they don't see me as part of the space like i'm like a it's very clear that i'm not like i'm different right and you you we i'm not saying that i was alone out there like it was just me you know but whenever you get a chance to like meet other uh, people that look like you that are in these spaces that like the things that you like, like I don't know, it's a comfort thing. Like, yeah, you know, I like it. I don't know why that reminded me of one of the times you took me to the smell, and I forget what band was playing, but a mosh pit had started, and I, for some reason, this fact about that moment popped in my head, where the only other like Latino dude in the crowd was the same guy that picked you up and like carried you across the room. So in my head, it's like, there can be only one <laughs> who's rushing you out the door. <laughs> I don't remember that. It was a funny moment. <laughs> um, I'm not saying it didn't happen. I'm just... But yeah, yeah. mosh pits get crazy. Have, every time I've ever heard someone talk about they they almost never remember what they did in the pit. Yeah, I encourage everybody to... I I didn't get to do as much research as I would have liked to do, and I... I want to do more. I want to learn more about this. I feel like I got a pretty good basic understanding of like who these artists are. And it, 
I I think hearing them speak about their experience and hearing them kind of explain their work, having already seen it, like a lot of these pieces that they talk about, we've seen. And then now you get the artist perspective is very interesting. Like, and again, it's just like very reaffirming and I encourage everybody to like seek them out. Cause especially if you're somebody like me that maybe feels that like, Oh, I'm not Mexican enough or I'm not Brown enough. And the things that I don't, the things that I like are not, uh, the things that are Chicano are not for me or whatever. I'm going to I'm going to keep I'm going to start to repeat myself, so I'm just going to leave it at that. If you gotten this far, uh what's something else you'd like us to check out whether it's art-wise or media-wise? We covered a movie review in our Patreon. Um let us know in the comments. And from all of us at un poquito. Don't, don't fly. fly.